Good morning, church. How are you guys doing? Uh, welcome to today's service, uh, the second service. Uh, it's my pleasure to see all of you here. You look nice, smiley face, and happy. Uh, and we thank God because that is his doing, that you are well. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have this morning to share with you the word of God. Uh, my name is uh, Colin Suching. I'm one of the servants here. Uh, I'm so blessed to have this opportunity to share with you. This uh, week, a week today, we will take a break from the book of Acts that uh, Pastor Peter Odoe has been uh, taking us through. Uh, we'll come back to it next week when he'll be back. Pray for him, pray for his family, pray for Pastor Josh and his family too, and all those who serve here, Pastor Wilfred, Pastor Joseph, and Pastor Preston and their families. Uh, today we are going to be in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 14. A few weeks ago, uh, one of our friends, uh, Matt, uh, did Luke chapter 15. It was amazing. Uh, he went up front for, for us. Please give us of what we are going to look at next. But today we'll be in Luke chapter 14. We are going to read uh, the last 10 verses. That is uh, verse 25 to verse 35. But before that, I'd love to say this. Uh, one of the major things that I take pleasure in as a person is the kind of discipleship that happens here at Calvary. Chapel Eldorate, we, we do disciple people. We don't mentor because the world has taken this word mentoring or mentorship and has turned it to mean their own feet. So what we do as a church, as a people, as a leadership, we do disciple people in the word of God, through the word of God, to see them growing. As our mission statement says, growing deeper together in the word of God. Uh, we do that throughout all ages. We have a children ministry that we are so blessed with the teachers who are doing good work, uh, teaching the kids through a curriculum that is Bible-based. And we have our young adults, we have the teens who... We disciple through the word of God. Yesterday we had an opportunity to have a hangout with the teens uh, who came. Thank you for the parents. To the parents who allow their teens to come out, we really enjoyed. My feet are so hurting because of running. You know, these, they are so young and energetic. Uh, so thank you for allowing them to come out, to be discipled, to be taught the things that concerns them through the Bible. Today's uh, text, we are going to call it the cost of being a disciple. The cost of being a disciple. You know, first thing first, we have to ask ourselves, who is a disciple? Or what does it mean having discipleship? Now, a disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ who is are being managed by Jesus Christ and committed to everything or the mission of Jesus Christ. That is a disciple, a true follower of Jesus Christ, committed to the things of Jesus Christ, and whose mission is uh, Jesus Christ, everything that he does. So we are going to read Luke chapter 14. I read from verse 25 to 35, and it says... Now a greater multitude went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brother, and sister, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whatever, and whoever does, does not bear his cross and 
come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, uh, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid down the foundation and is not able to finish it, to finish, all who sees it began to mock him, saying, this man to, began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks condition of peace. So likewise, whoever of you, whoever of you does not, who does not forsake all that he has cannot be, my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its favor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Our dear and heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We pray that you may uh, open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. You know, Father Lord, that uh, you've called us to be your disciples and at all times we have to count the costs. And uh, we pray, Father Lord, that this morning as we interact through these uh, few verses that you will teach us through it and uh, you will lead us to your course. In your name I do pray and believe. Amen. So, in the previous verses, before these, uh, Jesus, in the same look, Jesus gives a story of a master who prepared a feast. And uh, he happened to prepare a great supper and invited many to come to eat and enjoy. You know, in Africa, uh, in Kenya, we like inviting people to our places, right? We like to enjoy food and meals and uh, drinks with uh, your friends and your families. And so this is what happened. This master invited, uh, prepared a great supper and invited his uh, friends to come and join with him and dine with him that day. But it happened that they all started to give excuses on why they could not come and enjoy the supper with him. And so uh, the first one said, you know, I have bought a land and I'm not going to Make it. I want to go and see it. It is a good thing. It's a, it's a good thing to buy land, right? Yeah, to enjoy the fruit from the land and you want to cultivate it and build a house. It is a good thing. So he gave out excuses that I'm going to see it. And the second one said, no, I bought five yoke and I want to go and test them and see their capability if they can really do a good job. And he didn't show up. He went away. And the third one said, I just got married, and I want to go and spend time with my, with my wife and husband. So I won't make it. Marriage is a good thing, right? Weddings are good. So during the first day, the first week, first month, you want to spend time with your, with your spouse. So they all gave excuses, excuses why they could not uh, attend the supper. And at long last, the master said to his servants, do this, go to the streets and uh, gather everyone that you find, bring them to the supper, let them come and enjoy. And uh, why, why do I say this? Why do I say all this? Uh, there is much more than just being a follower or just simply accepting the invitation that we have been given. Jesus Christ has given us an invitation. He has already done everything that we need in order to come to him. He has opened up himself for us to approach him anytime, any day. There is no booking appointment. But we see, we'll see in these scriptures that there is more than just accepting the invitation. You have to follow it. It is 
It is a whole process. And so in verse 25 and 26, he says, when the great multitude went with him, he told them, if anyone cannot, comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying a true disciple come to him without reservation. No, putting Christ first in everything. Our following requires complete faithfulness and obedience to Jesus Christ than anyone else. You know, there is a story of a young man who wanted to get married. You know, our church has many young people who are looking forward to getting married. And this young man told the lady that if you ever come between me and God, we are finished. We are done. That is a condition that he was telling them. He was telling the, 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 the lady, nothing comes between me and God. And that is what Jesus is saying, putting him before everything. The word uh, hate as used in verse 26 is to show a great allegiance to Jesus Christ. There is there should be no sign of any idolatry between us and God. There should be no sign of anything that should separate us and God. And that is what Jesus is saying. If, in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, and yet his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You will think that, oh, you're hating my father and my mother, or my sister and my brother, it's simple. Or maybe you have been having quarrels with your father and mother, and you think now, oh yes, now the Bible has given me opportunity to hate my mother and father. No, that is not what it says. There is more than that. It says uh, in the second part of verse 26, Yes, and his own life. And even your own life, you cannot be his disciple. And we say idolatry is the worship of someone or something uh, that you're taking to be in the path of Jesus Christ, in the path of the Lord. We are not given any chance to put or to worship anything between us and God. It is God only who deserves our worship. And so, if you want to become his disciple, if you want to know the cost of being a disciple, it means forsaking all that you have, all that you are to follow Jesus Christ. And if you look at uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31, uh, the Lord Jesus says, and you shall worship the Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your whole soul, and your mind, and your strength. And you see, this gives us no opportunity to bring anything between us and God. It is him you worship with, with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. It involves everything that you are. And he says the second one is... You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and there is no greater commandment than this. So at first you must think, ah, so I've been given a chance to hate. That, it was, that is not what it means. It doesn't mean you hate hate the way we human beings define hatred. That is not what it means. It's just not putting anything between you and God. You will love your children, you love your husband, you love your wife, your mother and father, but do they come between you and God? And you see, we've been told before that the greatest uh, idolatry does not come from bad things only. They also come from good things. For example, I have a son who is seven years old. He's not evil. He's evil. He's, yeah. Yeah. May God save him. He's not bad, yeah? But he doesn't have to come between me and God. I have a wife whom I love so much, but she doesn't have to come between me and God. It is God first in my family, 
next, or my neighbor's next. It is him first. Idolatry does not come from bad things only. You might think of uh, money and property as the only things that uh, might be referred as idolatry, but it is not. Also, good things can be idol idols to us. And so, we must be very careful to avoid, avoid this great danger of idolatry. And we continue in verse 27 in Luke. It says, uh, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me. So there is just more than hating your father, hating your mother, hating your children, and hating yourself or for, for, for forsaking yourself. There is more than that. There is carrying the cross. And I don't mean the little rosaries that people carry or the chains that you have on your necks and with a cross on it. It weighs like five grams. That is not the cross that we are talking about. It is not. And Jesus in Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 23 says, Then he says to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So it is not something that you'll do it for once and forget. It is a daily thing. It is carrying your cross daily. Everyone has their own burden. I don't know the kind of burden that you have. I don't know the kind of cross that you want to bear or you have to bear. We have our own cross that we have. We have the burden that we, have, we bear daily. It is a daily thing. You carry it and follow Jesus Christ. And being a, dis a disciple requires that you do this self-denial, leaving behind all that you have, all that you are, and daily following Jesus Christ. You can't say that I prayed on the 1st of January and that was enough. You have to do it daily. You can't say the devotion that I did uh, last week on Sunday before I come to church, that was enough. You have to do it daily. As a disciple, it is a process, it is a whole process. Carrying your cross every day, it is a symbol of putting everything to dead and letting Jesus Christ live in you. You know, in the biblical times with the Romans, once you carry the cross, heading to the place of execution, there was no turning back. There was no turning back. It was a sentence of death. You will go to the carry the cross, go to the place of crucifixion, and you will be, you will die there. There is no coming back to tell your father and your mother or your kids that, oh, uh, I'll be back soon. Or, no, there was no turning back. And that is what it means. Carrying the cross every day, it is a place of no turning back. It is you walking with Jesus Christ every day, counting the cost that we have to bear as Christians. It refers to passive submission to all kind of affliction that we will face. And uh, we know for a fact that no one carries the cross for, for fun. It is, not carrying, it is not fun carrying heavy burdens. Unless you're going to gym, you want to build your muscles, and uh, that is the only place that what you want to do is, yeah? you suffer your body, but you have a benefit at the end of it, yeah? But the cross that you bear here as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, it is not fun. It is not. I'm not promising you that it is fun. But are we looking at the end result of it? Are we looking at the, the thing that we'll get at long last? You know, when, when I say carrying the cross, we mean you will be faced with difficult times in your life, in the process of disciple, being a disciple. But we are called to endure it all. Discipleship or being a disciple, you are called to endure. When someone is discipling you, you have to accept when they are telling you you are wrong, right? It is not, sometimes it is not easy. It hurts, but you have to endure through it all for you to become a good 
disciple. It is the same with us Christians. For you to become a good disciple, you have to endure all the affliction, the correction that we are being given through the scriptures. And endurance might not be easy or not enough, but we have been told through the scripture that endurance to the end is what matters. Open with me uh, Matthew chapter, six, uh, chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse 16 uh, to 22. These are the words of Jesus Christ. If you're there with me, uh, let's read. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpent and harmless as a dove. But be aware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you uh, in, your, in their synagogues. You will be brought before the governors and the kings for my, for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is, n it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Brothers, you will, you will, brothers will deliver up brothers to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to, uh, to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. You see, the salvation comes only to those people who endure to the end. We've been told you'll be hated by brothers and sisters. You'll be beaten up. You'll be put to death. You'll be brought before the council and the governors, before the, the kingship. But do not worry. Jesus Christ says, do not worry for he will give you or the spirit will give you the words that you'll speak at that hour. But the point of it all is he who endures it all to the end will be saved. Those who love, uh, those who love you will rise up against you, persecute you. They will, the persecution will come from every corner of your life, both from inside and outside. But we are being given an assurance that only those who endure to the end, they will be saved and they will have the joy of it all. And I want to give us an example of a soldier. You know, a soldier is not counted as one before they finish their training. For example, if you go into the barracks here in Moy Barracks, you go in, you only come out after you finish the training, right? You won't come out before. And for you to be called a soldier, for you to be called a true soldier, for you to be given the arms to carry around, for you to be given the badge to be called a soldier, you have to endure through all the, the affliction and all the suffering that you'll have, you'll go through there. You'll be given heavy logs to carry. You'll be sleeping in water just for training, cold water, very early in the morning, yeah. scrolling, going down in the mud, all that for the training for you to become a soldier. You will only be called one after the, you finish the training, right? And so that is the same as, as for us as Christians. For you to experience the joy that will come at the end of it, you have to endure it all. You have to endure the affliction that will come, the persecution that will, that will come after. We see an example of the apostles or the disciples of Jesus Christ. They went through a lot. Remember in Acts, uh, the apostle, the, the, Paul was beaten up, thrown out of the city, and still he went back to that same city where he was beaten to preach the gospel. He did not see anything that is more than just dying for the cause of the gospel and enjoy eternity with Christ. John, the persecution that he went through, being thrown in an island, staying there alone. 
being beaten to a point that they cannot even write scriptures. They were using soldiers to write scriptures. Those are examples of persecution that maybe at some point in our life we'll go through. We have testimonies of people in the world who they cannot even profess and say that they are Christian because they'll be abandoned by their families. But what have we been promised? Those people who endure to the end. Are we ready to count the cost? Are we ready to endure this for us to enjoy the eternity that we have been promised through the scriptures? That is a question that I want us to ask. Are we ready to believe in Jesus and follow him through it all? Are we ready to endure the whole course? Are you still on the track or did you flip and went away forever? It doesn't mean you won't flip at some point. You will. But when you flip away, do you come back or you just decide to give up the course that we have been called? We have examples of people who they really started well following the course of Jesus Christ, but because of the hardship that they endure, they chose to fall away. And in First John, in the letter of John, First John uh, chapter 2, verse, 19, verse 18 and 19, it says, Little children, it is the last hour, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many antichrists have come, by which we have known that it is the last hour. They went out of us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Many people have started really well with Christ, walking with Christ, but because of their affliction, they decided that we will follow, they will follow their own way. And so they have proven that at, even at first they were no, not of us. They were not of this fellowship that we have been called. And Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, he, he asks them this question. He tells them to examine themselves Examine yourself and see if you are still in the course. Are you still in the faith? Examine yourself. You have to start with your own life. Am I still in the course that I have been called? You know, the process of discipleship or being a disciple, it is a continuation. There is staying in the discipleship. It is like the process of salvation. You know, Jesus Christ, when he came, he saved us by dying on the cross we are being saved now through the process of sanctification, right? And at long last, we will be saved. It is a whole process. That is the whole process of discipleship. You have to stay in the course. You have to continue in the course. And let's go back to Luke uh, 14, where we are. Luke 14. And continue reading verse 28 to 32. It says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he lay the foundation and is not able to finish all, who sees it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make a war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Jesus Christ gives an example of two very simple examples that we can relate with as children of God, of builders. I know we have many builders in this house. For you to build, you have to count the costs you have to count the cost of starting from the foundation, digging the foundation until you, you finish. We always have to count the cost because it is the simplest thing that we can do. Sitting down with a professional and writing down, I need stone for foundation, I need stone to raise up the, the walls, I need 
uh, this amount of cement for plastering, I need this gypsum for ceiling and wood for the roof and the mabati, everything. You have to count the cost before you start building. Are you able to finish? Are you able to finish the house that you want to build? Or else you will start and leave it and we won't walk even near it because unfinished uh, buildings are dangerous, right? Will you allow your kids to walk by unfinished pro, uh, houses? You don't know who is hiding there. You, know, you don't know what is happening inside there. Yeah? So you have to count the cost. Are you ready to finish the mansion that you want to build, the tower that you want to build? Counting the cost. As a Christian, are you able to follow Jesus throughout the, the all cost? And he gives us an, another example of a king who goes in a war with another king. He has 10,000 and the other king has 20,000. If you think of it through a good mathematics, it is a ratio of one to two. It is a ratio of one soldier fighting two soldiers, right? Will you manage such a war? It is a hard war to fight unless God is on your side and fights for you like he did with Gideon with 300 men and thousands of people and he finished them. It was not Gideon, it was God working through those people. Unless you have God, then you can win such a war. But if we say like a church of 300 people or 200 people going to war against some people in the forest who are like a thousand, we won't manage such a war. And so he's telling us we should count the cost. Are we ready to endure throughout the whole world? And this is the thing that we have to think of. The other king with, uh, with 20,000 soldiers has a greater power, right? And the question that we have to consider here is, are we able to endure the greater power that is coming? After all, and if you look at the word consider here, it has been used as a military term, and it means to sit back, uh, watch closely, or observe keenly, closely, and see if you are able to win the fight. What you do as, uh, as, as a soldier is you, you take time to spy a place where you want to go and, and fight, yeah? You take time, you spy, and know that uh, for sure you have everything that you need for, for the fight. And the question is, in other words, are you able to face a greater power that is coming, a greater power than you? One mightier than you, for sure. Or are you going to surrender now? Because that is what we've been told the king did. Yeah? Are you ready to send out your message and say, I cannot do this fight and lift up a white uh, flag and say, I surrender. Are you ready to surrender now to Jesus or do you want to face the greater power that is coming after? That is a question that I want us to ask. And if you open with me uh, Philippians Philippians chapter 2, let us look at what Paul is telling the church of Philippi. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 uh, to 11, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider its robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no repetition, taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name of Jesus, a uh, name which is above every name. That is, that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow down of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, 
The question is, there is a greater power that is coming, a greater king that does not depend on a few thousand soldiers. Do you want to surrender to him now? Or do you want to wait until it is late? Because we have been told from the scriptures that every knee shall bow before him, whether you accepted him or you didn't. Those in heaven, on earth, and under earth, are you ready to surrender to him now, today? Or do you want to wait for that greater power which is going to destroy the whole earth? Are you ready to count the cost of waiting to the greater, of, uh, to the greater power? Or do you want to surrender now and follow him? And if you surrender now, there's a cost to it. If you surrender now, there's a cost to it. There is suffering that you will experience as a believer, affliction that you will experience as a believer, persecution from every corner, even from your own family members. But the joy that comes at last is what we are looking at. The joy that comes at last, at last is what we are fixing our eyes on. And on the other side, if you choose to surrender to him later, there is a greater cost to it, and that is losing eternal life. Who is there? Who is out there who wants to lose eternal life? I don't want. I would rather my hand be cut because I'm preaching the gospel. I'd rather be short because I'm preaching the gospel, but enjoy the eternity that comes. It will be a separation from us for, for only a short time, but it will be a reunion in heaven when we meet all of us there and enjoy eternity that we have been promised. And in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 13 and 14, Jesus speaks of uh, the narrow gate and the wide gate, and he says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. It is very wide, and many people go by it, but narrow is the gate that leads to life. For you to go through a door that is standard, that is, is 32 inch or 28 inch, you have to lay down everything that you have for you to pass through it, right? You can't go through a door that is 32 inch with a luggage that is six feet. You have to lay it down for you to go through the door, right? And so that is what we've been told here, that for you to go through that narrow gate, for you to go through the gate of eternal life, you have to lay down everything. Count the cost of laying down everything now and follow Jesus. Or go through the wide gate, which leads to destruction with everything that you have. And the idea here is to forsake everything. At first, we may think that it is very easy to hate a brother or a sister or family. That's easy. Uh, bearing your own cross, uh, that may be also easy to carry it because it is your own burden. But now, it says, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot become my disciple. Just, that is uh, Jesus speaking. You cannot become his disciple with everything that you are. You have to lay it down. And lastly, in the last two verses, uh, he says in Luke 14, let's go back there. It says, the last two verses, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out, but men throw it out. He who he has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, as a Christian, if you lose the preservative that you have, what value are you to the society? It is of no use as a follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when writing uh, through the revelation of uh, John, to, when he, he gave to John, 
writing to the seven churches in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, he finishes every time he writes to the seven churches saying, let him who has here, ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And you might think of it, what, of what benefit is it if I become a true disciple? These are the two are the benefits of becoming a true disciple or counting the cost of being a follower of Jesus. One, you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And we know for a fact that we have had many testimonies of people who have been set free because they chose to follow Jesus Christ. And you might think, uh, does it uh, only come by knowing Jesus Christ? When we say you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I love the fact that here in Calvary, uh, we do Bible study uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse through the whole Bible. And it is important to look at this statement before we even say it out. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This is a verse that many people know it, even non-believers, right? But what comes before that? In John chapter 8, verse 31, it says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So there is a cost to it. There is a cost to abide in Jesus Christ for you to be set free. And he says, you will be my disciple indeed if you abide in Jesus Christ, abide in him. And we see that freedom comes when you only know the truth. And we know that the tr truth is Jesus Christ only. I have had opportunity to... Uh, walk with people who have known Christ for very long, for 20, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, talking with them. But in the midst of our talking, none of them, to my experience, has ever said they regret walking with Jesus Christ. Never. Be it 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, no one has ever told me that they regret their walk with Jesus Christ. That, do I mean that there is no affliction? Do I mean there is no persecution throughout the life? There is, right? But they have chosen to endure it. They have chosen to count the cost as Christian. As I call the worship team to come, we have to count the cost. It doesn't matter how long it's going to take. It doesn't matter uh, what we'll go through, the hardship that we will face, but we have to count the cost and follow him. Lastly, uh, again, we have to go back and say, uh, who then is a true disciple? Who is a true follower of Jesus Christ? One, a true follower of Jesus Christ is a genuine follower of the Lord, genuine follower of the Lord. Two, is one who perseveres through the faith. I've told you of what Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He says, examine yourself and see if you are still in the faith. You have to persevere through the faith. And perseverance doesn't come when you are enjoying. It comes when you're facing difficulties, right? And the third one, uh, it's one who endures through suffering and blessings, faithful to the end, and one who is lovingly obedient to the word of God. You have to obediently follow through the scripture every Scripture, everything that the scripture says, you have to obediently follow it. And that is when you will be qualified to say that you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ. So we have to count the cost. As Christians, we have to ask ourselves, are we still ready to follow Jesus Christ? 
both answers, yes or no, has consequences or has the gift at the end. If you, che- if you say yes now, there is a gift of eternal life. If you say no, there is a gift of eternal condemnation in hell. And who wants to spend eternity in hell? No one. And so I will urge you, church, to count the cost. You might have been walking with Jesus for many years, and maybe you are almost giving up. I'll urge you not to giving up. You might be young in salvation, and you're thinking, uh, if this is the cost, then I don't want to follow it. Follow it for a better cost that is coming in future. Amen? Let's pray uh, for the offering and uh, for the word of God as it goes down in our heart. We thank you, Lord Jesus, uh, for giving us opportunity to uh, interact with your word. Thank you, Father, for giving us an assurance of the blessing that is coming to those people who choose to count the cost to follow you. Those people who choose the, to ignore everything that uh, might come as affliction and persecution in our life just to follow you. We love you, Father, because we know that you are with us and you will give us strength to go through it all. We pray for the Lord that uh, you will enable us to walk with you, stand with you, even when the world and our community is going uh, to do evil, that we will choose to say, yes, we are Christians, and yes, we are ready to, fall, to, to fight the good fight and to endure all the persecution that will come. We love you, Lord, and we pray even as we give the offerings that you'll bless it to the work that we have done through it and uh, you'll give us as a blessing to help the church and help the needy in our societies, Lord. We love you and we worship your name in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I do pray and believe. Amen. Be blessed, church.